Radio. The people that get a lot of their climbing, they stay in the game a long time and really achieve and perform are very good at setting expectations. Unrealistic yeah. expectations are a real killer. Hey y'all, I'm Ryan Devlin and welcome to this month's Struggle Climbing Show Coach Chat with Tom Randall. You know, Tom and I connect usually about once a month for a deep dive into one or two specific areas of training and performance that will hopefully help us all to level up our game. And then Tom graciously fields a few patron questions on any number of topics. And today we cover a few interesting ones, including when Tom and Ollie worked with Alex Honnold on the free solo tour to help him level up his sport grade, the hardest climb he's ever done, and what it took to get him there. Now, the main focus of today's chat is on things that we can all do to give ourselves the best chance of sending on the day. You've put in months of training up to this point. You've worked on the project. You know the moves, whether that's a boulder or a route inside or in the gym or on the moon board, whatever. And now it is the day, you all, to make a go at the send. What can we do? to unlock a few extra percent when it counts the most? Well, listen up and you will find out. There's all sorts of good stuff in this one. This Coach Chat's brought to you by our friends over at Friction Labs, from Alex Magos to Michaela Kirsch and so many other mega crushers. Pros trust Friction Labs because their performance chalk lasts longer and is free of fillers and rosin and drying agents and all that stuff. And why would you care about that? Well, it's a good question. You know what it means? It means that your skin is going to stay in better shape. And that's kind of important for us climbers, as it turns out. You know, I was actually just out climbing yesterday with Jordan Cannon, friend of the show, Jordan Cannon, and also Friction Labs athlete, Jordan Cannon. And we were both hitting their secret stuff liquid chalk because it was like 75 degrees out at the red. And we needed all the friction we could get as we pulled on these shallow little pockets of my fall project. And you know what? It worked. You guys, I got a new high point. I'm so psyched. I too hung the route. I was holding on, even though it was hot, I was sticking to those holds. I really do feel the difference, and I think you will too. You can probably find Friction Labs at your local gym. They're like at almost all the gyms in the country. But you can also score 20% off by entering code STRUGGLE20 at frictionlabs.com. So check it out. Chalk up less and climb more with Friction Labs. And this episode is also sponsored by patrons and subscribers of the show. If that's you, thank you so much. I love you. Over at Patreon, you can see the uncut video of this chat today with Tom and also gain access to 20 plus hours of exclusive content from the likes of Chris Sharma, Alex Honnold, Nina Williams, Ravioli Biceps, and so many more. Plus, if you sign up before the end of October, which is just like the next few days here, you will be entered to win a brand new pair of Scarpa shoes. What? It's like up to $280, I think, is what this gift certificate's for. So there is not a better time to check out all those bonus features than right this second. You can quit any time. There's no commitment. I'm just grateful that you're here, and I am psyched to keep putting out shows like this that hopefully help you on your own climbing journey. So thank you so much. Oh, and one last thing. Stay tuned at the end of this episode, y'all, to hear the trailer for a brand new climbing series that's coming out soon called Written in Stone. I just listened to the first episode and it's absolutely banger. I cannot wait for you to check this out. But first, let's get ready to Red Point with Tom Randall. I can't even believe we're talking right now because you're like hopping on an airplane in like 12 hours. Yeah, I think it actually might be quite less than that. I've got to get up at 4 a.m. tomorrow, so it's like a definite early rise to oh my God. go and get a plane over to Salt, Salt Lake City. But are, are you heading off to the yeah, White Rim? Actually not, no. Heading to some of the walls outside of Moab where there's this route called Stranger Than Fiction, which is one of the kind of last unrepeated, very hard cracks in the States. So... It's a really cool little prize to go after, and me and Peter are both going to try and do it this season. Oh, hell yeah. That's fantastic. Well, good. That's a, probably a good place for us to jump in here. We're now getting into send season. We've been talking for months now, preparing non-specific training, getting more specific in our training, working to kind of top off the tank as the red point attempts approach. And here we are into late October. You're going to be heading off to do your project. I'm deep into my project. Got a high point yesterday, by the way. I'm feeling psyched about oh, that. 
Did you? Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's going to take some more time here. There's going to be, but big links yesterday. I I was actually out climbing with Jordan Cannon. He's in uh, the red for the season and uh, he wanted to check out the project. So we were kind of like pumping each other up and I went ground through the boulder crux, which is at bolt five. And then a few more moves just before the next big rest where I probably could have recovered and made a little bit more of a punch. But then I got uh, the two hang on it. And uh, those were big strides for me. I'm feeling really good about that progress. I'm not quite to going for red points yet, but I think probably between now and the next time we talk, I will. So uh, I'm I'm excited for this part of the conversation here because we've been, this whole season has been leading up to this, which is pretty soon. And those who are listening right now, I'm sure they're approaching their fall, fall projects in the same way. And by the way, that could be a boulder or a sport route or a trad route or a moonboard problem in any regard. We all have these things we've been working on. And today I'd like to talk about what we can do on the day. And I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on that. I mean, what, kind of what does this even encompass when we're talking about giving ourselves the best chance to succeed on that day? So, so I suppose the way to view achieving and, you know, the tip of the iceberg, I suppose, in terms of all the preparation work that goes into any project or send that you want to do is to see this as being the application of all the work that you've done to sort of laying it down there and then the situation. So just like the training and the preparation that we do for any project, you want to take, I suppose, like a four-part approach to any kind of send, go or send day and break it down into the physical aspect of it, the tactical aspect, the technique and the psychological. And those are the sort of the four big building blocks that go into any performance, whether we're talking about way back in the foundational preparation phase or the thing on the day. So I suppose the logical thing for us to do maybe today is to talk through each of those four pillars, I suppose, of what occurs on the day uh, on those and what I think is the best way to get, you know, the most out of the preparation that you have done. Yeah, I love that. Okay, great. Yeah, let's dive in. Uh, So I wake up in the morning, I'm getting my gear ready, I'm going to be heading out to the crag. What's the first thing that you'd like us to be focusing on? Uh, On the day, uh, I think what you want to have had ready before that stage is you want to take out any of the unknowns out of any red pointing situation and also taking care from a i suppose a planning point of view any of the controllables so the unknowns are often things that you don't even know until the day so they can be things like the weather conditions or they can be what mood your climbing partner is in or just how you happen to feel on the day like your energy levels on those days And those unknowns can generally be dealt with by being aware of how those make you feel and perform on other days when you go out climbing. So what I try to try trying to do for myself and encourage others is have a bit of a reflection and think about how you do when the energy isn't right from your climbing partner, how much is that going to affect things? How much is it going to affect things if the conditions aren't quite right, the temperatures aren't quite right? Because then what that allows you to do on the day is essentially set expectations for what you want to achieve in the day. So that's a really important part of that start starting part of the day when you first get up is look at some of those uncontrollables, those unknowns, and set those expectations because you end up with a much more, I suppose, productive and high contentment day an enjoyable day out of your climbing if the expectations line up with reality even if you didn't send so i think that's the first part that you want to get done so, today yeah and just to, to kind of explore one of those variables let's say we're a weekend warrior we know we've got saturday to climb because we got family stuff on sunday and you know limited days left in the season so we the option really isn't to just say like forget it i'm not going to go out tomorrow so we wake up and the humidity is a little bit higher than we would like it to be, or the temperatures are a little bit higher than, you know, than we'd like, we're still going to go out because this is our day. And, you know, are you saying, hey, let's take a look at this and perhaps not expect 
ascend or understand that, okay, it's maybe suboptimal, but I'm not going to let that get in my head. I'm still going to go out there and expect to send. I guess that's kind of two different ways of looking at it, right? Yeah. So I would say on the whole, it's most productive for the majority of people to say the conditions are suboptimal. What's the best strategy? What moderation can I do to my day's activities over going for the big send if I think that realistically is going to make a difference? Sure, some people can actually still get over it and have got enough margin for error. But a lot of the time, you'll get more people having more results out of the day by saying now, okay, so it's really cold, for example. It's colder than you expected. You know you're going to numb out. Is saying, I'm going to spend a session now completely dialing in the very short, hard section of that climbing and doing just maybe three, four, five laps on the really hard crux section of the route because that's going to be short enough that I'm not going to numb out. I'm just going to refine that movement. I'm going to feel really good mentally. That's going to really build me up. And also from a sort of recruitment and top end strength level, it's going to be good because you're working just on the sort of high intensity work and you'll still walk away from that day going, awesome. I felt really good on that. The moment it drops in two days time and I'm going to get slightly warmer conditions, I'm really on rather than going and trying it, numbing out early, not really getting through any of the crux, potentially even reduce increasing your injury risk because you've got really cold hands, fingers, et cetera, which has just had way more downside. You can walk away from that experience with more output, I guess, and more enjoyment from the day. Or it could be saying it's really sweaty and the humidity is too high. So I know that once I've done more than eight to 10 moves in a row in the, those sort of levels of humidity conditions, I'm sweating out so much of my tips that I'm just not going to be getting through the crux in that way. So what I'll do is I'll go to the bolt where the crux starts. I'll chalk up fresh from there. And then I'll climb to the point where I do start to sweat out, lower off, again, repeat the same thing. You just get more product productivity out of the, the day. And I've just seen this time and time again that people that get a lot at their climbing, they stay in the game a long time and really, you know, achieve and perform are very good at setting expectations. Unrealistic yeah. expectations are a real killer. Great. Yeah, I like that. I really appreciate that. It's also just to your earlier point, it, it can make for a more enjoyable day, which is what 99.99% of everyone listening right now is, is climbing for. We're not paying the bills. We want to go out and, and enjoy ourselves. And when there is that dissonance between the reality and the expectation, there can be discomfort, there can be some friction there. So I think it's nice to focus on or to be aware of that as we uh, could alleviate ourselves of that discomfort uh, of kind of that incongruity between expectation and reality. That said, I do also want to make sure that we're looking at what happens when the conditions are good enough to make an RP go. And so, you know, what can we do to give ourselves the best chance there? But I think, you know, we haven't quite gotten there. So let's continue to focus yeah. on addressing these pillars until we get to the point at which the stars are aligning and we might, this might be the day. Yeah. So going back to kind of some of those pillars, I think the bits where you have these controllables and you can really prepare for doing well on the day can very much be addressed on those physical parts, the tactical parts, and the technique. And a lot of that means that from a on-the-day performance point of view is, let's say we take technique to start with, is that you will have a range of techniques that you will use on your route. Those are, you know, heels, drop knees, big wide moves, whatever they are. And from a physical point of view, is that you can warm up so the muscles, the joints, the range of movement, which is required for those particular techniques. So you allow yourself the greatest ability to be able to execute those techniques to the best possible sort of level of capacity that you have. Secondly, is that you will also, by warming up appropriately and exploring the full range of movement, hopefully reduce injury potential for on the route because injury risk does slowly increase as you start kind of increasingly hammering a route and keep on repetitively stressing the body in it exactly the same way. And also by doing that and preparing your 
the specifics of that kind of technique work, you'll also improve that kind of mental game in terms of the sort of visualization, thinking through those moves that you're going to be doing. And that will really help with the confidence as well. And then going to the physical side of things for the route, I think there's a certain aspect of the warm up that needs to be personalized or individualized to the demands of the route that you're doing. So a lot of mis- the mistake that I see a lot of people do in terms of warm up is that they carry out this sort of generic warm up that they've learned when they go down the gym or they copied from their friend. And this might not actually prepare your body specifically for what you're trying to do, because I would argue that a warm up for a very short, hard, powerful route will look very different from something that's a huge, long, pumpy route, for example. Mm. A warm-up for a vert, techy slab, very different from a warm-up for a 45 to 80-degree roof on much bigger holds and is much more physical. So really think about dialing down that warm-up so that it suits the demands of your route, and I think that really increases the chance of success on it. And another part of the kind of physical equation I think makes a difference as well is getting climbers to understand that very high intensity finger recruitment or forearm flexor recruitment as part of the warm up. So high intensity fingerboarding will often result in really good performance on the route as long as you're not pushing the fatigue envelope at all. Okay, great. I love this. So kind of two things to unpack here and I want to unpack both of them because I think they're uh, going to be critical for me and, and for a lot of people to give themselves the best shot on the day. So first, let's talk about the warm up in terms of how we go from general to specific. And it's going to be hard for you to speak to all the specifics because there's so many different types of routes out there from four move limit boulder problems to, you know, 100 meter sport routes and this kind of thing. But you mentioned a pitfall of people maybe going in and just doing like the general warm up that they would at the gym and maybe it's some arm circles and some push ups and some squats and you're doing some wrist rolls and this kind of thing how do we go from kind of generally warming up the body to then to your point if there's heel hooks if there's toe hooks if there's kind of specific shouldery things to warming up on the ground i'm assuming as opposed to warming up on the route or maybe it's a combination of both just how would you kind of take a look at that Yeah, so the way that I would tend to address it is in an ideal world, actually being able to warm up on sections of the route is really good. It depends on the steepness and the kind of logistics of being on a rope and working sections because what you don't want to do is you don't want to develop too much fatigue or potentially damage to skin on the route if the skin, like the route's harsh on skin. But being able to pull on to just individual moves do one move or just maybe even two moves at a go and slowly work your way through that crux section. Even if sometimes it's just holding the positions and creating tension between the hands and the feet, I think is a really good part of the warm up. But I would say that should be right at the end part of the warm up, just as you're thinking, right, now I'm preparing the last sort of 15 to 30 minutes before I actually go on the red point. But before that, the warm up in terms of moving from this generalized arm circling, doing some traversing, getting lightly warmed up, pumped, etc. It should be treated as essentially like a ramp test or a ramping up of the intensity and the volume that you're doing in the warm up so that it increasingly looks like the thing that you're about to do. So for example, if you're going to go and do a route which is includes a sequence of six moves of v10 bouldering in the middle of the crux relatively low down then you want your warm-up to include increasingly hard bouldering that must more or less peak at a standard of v10 maybe even v11 maybe even v12 if you've got something Mm. worked at the crag and it has to look like that thing you don't want to go and do a warm-up to up to a couple of problems of v6 and then try and get pumped because it doesn't look like what you're trying to achieve. Likewise, if you're going to do a really long route and get really pumped and you want the blood supply network to be fully warmed up, you want all of the muscles in the body because it's going to be a bit more of a sort of a wrestling route and you're going to be on there using all the muscle groups and being up for longer, 
then you want to have a much longer, higher duration warm up, which does get you pretty pumped and is a lot longer in terms of the route that you do and a sort of moderate intensity, which means that you have to have much longer rests in that warm up process leading up to the red point attempt. Yeah, this is really interesting. And this kind of goes back to a bit of a debate that I have with a lot of my friends, which is kind of at which point does the warm up become more fatiguing and diminishing returns, in fact, than just trying to do goes, you know, on on the route. And you had mentioned in the second part of your introduction to this warm up, trying to pull really hard and, and getting some like max recruitment going as maybe part of the tail end of the warm up. And I'm assuming that could be on a, you know, a board that you hook around a, a rock or on the first bolt of a route or something like that or your foot. But again, brings up the question, how much do we want to be kind of max stressing our fingers? Or in the case of a long sport route, like you were talking about, which is like something that I'm working on, how much mileage do I want to put in before then I'm maybe not 100% when it comes to the route? And I think for me, I, I my friends are always like, you never warm up enough, you never warm up enough. And, and that may be true. So I'm curious what you've seen with clients and with the data at Lattice when it comes to, you know, how much is feels right compared to what we might perceive as too much or too little? Mm, it is a really difficult question to uh, answer for any climber because a lot of the equation is dealt with by self-experimentation and will also change over the years depending on the the amount of training volume that you do Mm -hmm. so if you are a climber who typically struggles to hold down a lot of training volume and you haven't had a great deal of it in the cycle leading up to your red point project perhaps you're kind of arriving at the peak part of the season and thinking i just was really busy with work i didn't get as much done i wanted to I could have done with a couple more days down the wall every single week, then you will have to be quite a bit more careful with that warm up in terms of the volume that you have and the sort of the fatigue element that goes in there. But if you've put in a lot of volume into your training period and you're really well prepared, I would say you can put a reasonable amount of proper warm up volume. You shouldn't be scared of that. And in a way, maybe what you're not tackling is the amount of rest that you need to have after the warm-up attempt. Don't expect to go and spend 15 minutes on a relatively hard warm-up route and get quite pumped and feel great after 15 minutes. You've got to be an absolute superstar to be doing that. That's more right. like what you do down the wall and you know doing short rests. But if you spend 45 minutes resting after that 15 attempt, maybe even an hour, and you're going and keeping warm and you're keeping prepared, then that's much more the kind of time window that you want you to be looking at it. I think I remember some Spanish climbers telling me that they looked at the ratio for when they would do something that would get them pumped, then they would try and rest at least five times the amount of time that they were on the route. So if they tried the route and it took them 10 minutes and they got pumped and they fell off or they got to the top, then it would be a 50 minute rest before they would have another attempt. If you spend one hour on some massive stamina fest and you're on there forever, then yeah, intuitively, if you said an hour of effort and it was really hard, I think I would want maybe five hours, like half a day to go and eat some food, sit down, completely recover for it and that feels about right so somewhere around that is the kind of ratio and i think yeah most people couldn't go too far wrong with saying that you also wouldn't want to do in your warm-up much more than maybe 20 percent of your normal workout volume within your warm-up any more than that i think you're definitely overcooking it got it got it and then to <clears throat> kind of play out the thought experiment on the other side of the spectrum. If it's a boulder problem and it's, you know, you it's two limit moves and you pull those and you pop off and maybe that took you 30 seconds, you're talking about maybe just resting a few minutes. Yes. Yeah, so you can rest a, a lot shorter amount of time that. And I think that probably goes back into that. Do you remember I told you a while back about post-activation potentiation? 
yes. and how there is a sort of way of sort of preparing and warming up the soft tissues for really high intensity work. And I believe the window from the sort of the, the whole PAP thing is around four to 12 minutes is your sweet spot of window after really high intensity work. So from a warm up perspective, if you've warmed up, you feel really prepared, you've just done a really good quality hang or a couple of really hard moves in a boulder and thinking, right, now I'm going to have that attempt on that boulder, really go for it. Somewhere within four to 12 minutes after that really good quality last bit of the warm up, I think would be the window that you would probably address that at. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up um, that post-activation potentiation. And, and so for those who are listening, you'll have to find it in, in one of our prior uh, conversations. I'll try to link to it here. But maybe worth recapping because we are talking about giving us the best opportunity to send on the day. And if I'm recalling correctly, it's basically about 10 minutes, or you were saying kind of in that uh, four to 12 minute range, you're doing some really hard efforts. Like we were, you were talking about working, doing some pull-ups to the point where it's weighted pull-ups, you're hooking your ankles around a boulder or a tree root or something like that. So you're essentially pulling against an immovable force. So you're working your way up a, a few fast pull-ups, a few kind of body weight pull-ups, and then a few like impossible pull-ups. And then similar with hangs, some maybe 70% hangs, 80% hangs, 90% hangs or something like that, but just a few of them. And then you're saying rest, maybe that five to 10 minute range. And that's going to prime the system that's going to kind of develop that max recruitment so that when you get on your route or your boulder or whatever it is, you're kind of firing on all cylinders. Am I recapping that correctly? And maybe if I left anything out, you could fill in the blanks. Hey, yeah, that, that's, that's more or less right, except from the pull-up point of view is it's actually completing kind of full pull-ups. So it's not isometric work. God. It's that sort of full concentric and like, you know, I guess it's sort of the eccentric lowering part that you do of the pull-up, but it is high intensity and I advise people to do it. I do it myself in double reps with those. So really low volume, but high intensity work, slowly ramping up closer and closer towards your maximum. But I think the key thing to understand with any of that post-activation potentiation or just high intensity preparation work for any hard climbing effort is that you need to have in mind what is your what does your window look like for really high intensity effort so when you do your fingerboard sessions do you feel really good for 6 reps of 5 seconds 10 reps of 5 seconds like have those numbers kind of roughly in your head because that's what you need to use as a guide for how far you extend out in your warm up if you're someone that burns through that top end effort really quickly you're going to have that bear that in mind for how you warm up and then attempt your route but if you're someone that's got a lot in the tank then yeah your warm up can be quite comprehensive and so that's just kind of knowledge that you build about yourself and understand yourself over the years in the same way like people have to understand what does their tapering cycle look like and how is that individualized to them over the years because everyone is very individual on this front. And I think it's exactly the same for warm-ups. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. So then if I'm working, it'll take me for an example, if I'm working on the sport route that's 65 feet and it's really hard, so I'm going to be on the route for probably 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going to take an hour in between goes. Should I then do another full kind of warm-up as I'm approaching my next attempt? Or is that post-activation potentiation kind of enough, my body's going to be warm from doing the route an hour earlier, then maybe I just kind of hit those hard max pulls on the fingers and the pull-ups, wait 10 minutes and then hop on? Or do you recommend an additional kind of warm-up prior to that next go? Yeah, so uh, the PAP work is going to require another cycle of it if you need to develop that absolute maximal level of force. But I think it's important to understand that do the demands of the route that you're trying require maximal bouldering ability? Mm -hmm. Because if the boulder problem is right at your maximum or very close to it on the route, then I think the demands of it require or at least merit looking at that type of approach. But if your route has a maximum boulder grade of V3 on it and your max bouldering grade is V6, arguably 
there's, it's not the best use of your time and could, and could add to the fatigability effect within the route. So in that case, you might say, no, it's more beneficial for me to be really well warmed up, to have visualized appropriately, to have brushed all the holds, to have worked through all the techniques and make sure I explore the full range of motion rather than looking at some kind of post-activation potentiation. Got it. So at this point, we've removed or we've kind of reconciled any expectations that we might have for the day on the uncontrollable variables, whether they're bouncing in our favor or not. We're out. We've done a generalized warm up. We've done a specific warm up, maybe a bolt to bolt on a sport route like I'm going to be doing. Um, so I'm familiarizing myself with the holds, maybe brushing them as I go and that kind of thing. And then getting that pap work if I'm going to be pulling max moves to really prime the system. Now, where are we at? What does what else does that leave to give ourselves the absolute best chance to send? So I think the last part of the equation, well, not the last part of the equation, but another important part of it, which I think elite level climbers are good at doing this. And the general population of climbers sometimes come across it by accident, but they take their years to develop it, is understanding where your mental state is or how you control for state or like manage your state before attempting something really hard whether that's a boulder or a route and i think the particular or the peculiarities of this is that whether it's a trad route or a sport route or a boulder they all have optimal states that you need to be in mentally to operate at your technical tactical or physical maximum and if you can start to understand what those mental states are in terms of optimization for you personally and for the demands of what you're trying to do is you can one think about how you're feeling right now before attempting the route and going do i feel like i'm in in that optimal mental state and does it match up with what i need to do if it's a yes then it's right let's go for this and let's go all in if it's a no it can very well be, no, actually, I'm going to take a step back from this and I'm going to take a little bit more prep time. Something's not quite right. Maybe I just need to spend a bit more time calming down. Maybe I need to get more G'd up. Maybe I need to do some more visualization. Maybe I just need to go back up on the route and warm up a little bit more and just feel more mentally prepared on it. But I think they, the elite level climbers are good at keying in the state that's required for the route and most of us who are generalized climbers and we drift between this boulder performance, sport performance, even some do trad as well, don't necessarily realize that I think there's very distinctive mental states required for all three of those exercises and they're different and you can't just come with your generic, I'm psyched. It, it needs to look different. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. It's interesting when I had a conversation with Alex Honnold on this podcast, he um, brought up something similar because he has to switch between very cautious free solo mentality is very different than when he's trying to do a limit project on rope on a sport route where, you know, you have to be willing to take what are perceived as risks, but not, he doesn't see them as risks, but like, you know, lower percentage movement is what he would say. Um, but he said that he really wrestled with that. Like it, it's very hard for him to go from like a soloing window in his year to a try hard sport window because of that mental switch that's required. And so it's interesting that you note that because I think to a lesser extent, we all do that, whether, you know, if we're at a gym on an auto belay is going to be different than when we're out at the crag and we're on the sharp end and we really need to kind of click into a different mental mode of trying hard or just being prepared for what's to come. So I think that's nice. And maybe a future episode like with Hazel Finlay could be could be good on just that very specific topic on the mental game side. Is there anything else? This is all great stuff. I'm getting psyched to go put in red point burns. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting psyched now. I want to make sure we get to a, a few patron questions here. But is there anything else on the day? Little tips or tricks, little secrets, things that you might be implementing as you go out and try? So I think one tip that I have for everyone and I really like using is I try and bring as many familiar routine elements into my red point days as I possibly can so that I'm not digesting new information as such. So I'm someone 
that I, I get overstimulated by things effectively. And if I get overstimulated, I'm not in the best mental state for actually climbing something really hard because I actually climb quite well when I'm really calm. So if I see that I've got a new harness and a slightly different chalk bag that I usually use and I'm using my friend's rope rather than my rope and I don't know, all those little things that are slightly different, that for me is just adds in to the overstimulation pile. And then I've been thinking about that new harness and going, oh, I like that new feature there or oh, I don't know whether I like that tie-in loop there. It looks different to normal. Or, oh, does that rope work with that really old grigri? You know, like, there's just these extra things that you end up thinking about. And I, the same goes for food, actually, as well, is take the same kind of stuff that you're just familiar with, and it seems really boring and routine. So in an ideal world, way, I would say, turn up with, the partner you've climbed for with for the last 10 years, the rope that you've climbed with for the last two years, the same harness, the same shoes, exactly the same peanut butter sandwich that you eat every freaking Tuesday. You know, like keep all those things consistent because there's plenty of other stuff which is very stimulating, which is trying really hard to red point something which is at your limit. And that's where your energy basket wants to go. Love that. Love that. Essentially removing as many variables as possible so that you can keep your mind focused on the task at hand. I think this is why mm-hmm. Steve Jobs wore the same black turtleneck every single day. You know, didn't have to think about it. Or you with the uh, black lattice sweatshirt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think, what should I wear for this podcast? I'm probably supposed to look smart. And then I go, oh, I've got one of those lattice sweatshirts. So I'll just wear that. I don't have to think about anything then. All right, y'all, just a quick second here to tell you about Fretitious Climbing, which is a sponsor of the pod and also has totally changed the game for how and where I hangboard. Have you all seen this? The revolutionary doorway mount is just the coolest. It allows you to do a full hangboard workout without drilling, screwing, or mounting anything permanently into your walls. You just pop it into your doorway and then mount any hangboard that you want to it. I love the boards that Fretitious makes, and they'll give you 20% off when you buy one with this doorway kit. But you can also just mount any other board that you have. You can hang heavy or they have a pulley attachment that you can grab if you want to reduce the load like I do when I'm working on one arm hangs or if I'm doing endurance repeaters. If you cannot drill a board into your wall, whether you rent or you're a student or maybe your significant other just doesn't want a chalky hang board always on display like mine, you can store this under a bed or wherever and in seconds pop it into the doorway get your workout in, and then make it disappear. It's such a cool system. Hit that link in your show notes or pop by frictitiousclimbing.com to see it all in action, and you can get 20% off a hangboard when you purchase that rad doorway mount. All right, let's get back to the show here. I know you've got to catch an early flight, but I've got a few patron questions here. We'll just get to the, the ones that we can. Victor writes, You've helped to train some of the absolute best climbers in the world. Which one or two stand out in terms of how you or the team were able to help them level up? Oh, um, so I think we're probably really proud of the work that we did with Alex Honnold because he is known as a world-class trad climber and free soloist. But Ollie worked with him during a period when he was touring all over the world, going to all these film premieres and doing a lot of travel and really kind of impractical to do a lot of training to then achieving his first 9A on sport, which really isn't in Alex's sort of specialization or wheelhouse as such, and on top of what you would normally say as being too much going on. It's not practical to achieve your new physical limit. And it doesn't play to his physical strengths either. So I think that's certainly someone that, yeah, as an organization and certainly for Ollie as well, is really proud of that work because I think that was challenging to do that. And, you know, loads of hard work went in from Alex, but you certainly had to take a, a smart approach with training under those kind of, under that kind of framework. Yeah, this is, I mean, somebody who's got, endurance coming out of his ears because uh, he had just come off of doing the free rider in a couple hours and, and this kind of thing. But to climb 9A, 14D, I'm assuming took a different level of strength or recruitment or tension. 
I think he spent some time with you all in, in Sheffield when he was on that film tour. Can you give me an insight on what areas of opportunity, I won't call them weaknesses because he's obviously a very strong climber, but what areas of opportunity you identified and how you helped him to focus on those to achieve that level up on, on the sports side? So one of the, the obvious standout things that came out straight away was the level of finger strength that Alex mm -hmm. had, and which isn't massively surprising because he's a trad climber. He's very fit, spent a lot of time doing high volume work. So naturally, those climbers do have relatively weaker fingers compared to their sort of um, peers at the same kind of grade. And so that stood out as something that really needed to be worked on to have a better chance of achieving 9A. And then also the amount of generalized strength and conditioning that he had in the upper body that was more suited towards that high intensity bouldering power work. Like the project that he had was, it was really steep and there was certainly a lot of work that had to be done on that front. But like many of these things is it's about saying there may be six or seven things that we could work on here, but let's focus on one or two, which will make a significant difference, do a really good job on those one or two, see how that is after a year. Maybe that's enough to achieve the goals and then sort of reiterate from there and just take a, a focused approach. Yeah, well, it, it obviously worked and he, he achieved the, the highest grade. I'm curious when you work with somebody like Alex or, or other elite athletes where you identify that finger strength is an area of opportunity, uh, is it as simple as programming some hangboarding or limit bouldering? Or, you know, what does that look like for those who are at that very high end? Yeah, so at the elite end, it's uh, very much a combination of hangboard work or pickup work as well. We, we tend to use a combination of both of those in terms of finger strength work and high intensity bouldering. Uh, both of those are very effective ways of uh, building finger strength and they just need to be cycled into the right part of the plan in an appropriate phase and understand that if you're trying to work on that basic maximal strength sort of the capacity for the forearm flexes to generate force it's generally going to have better results from working in a targeted specific controllable measurable way on a fingerboard or lifting versus on a system board but it's not to say that the system board isn't really good in terms of being used in conjunction with that work, but also to fine tune it at the end in terms of developing rate of force development and your contact strength that it may well also be known as or the power to be able to pull from those positions and generate tension through the body from sort of tip to toe. Right. Well, I, one of the most impressive things I think you pulled off with Alex in, in this whole thing was getting him to actually do that stuff. Because every time I talk to him, he says he just likes to climb. He just wants to be outside <laughs> climbing seven days a week and forget the gym and forget the garage and these kinds of things. So the fact that you were able to get him to actually stick to a program, that's some 9A coaching. Yeah, it was, it was a good effort for him because it it isn't his thing as such. But we always hope that when we work with anyone, even if they don't end up training with us or with themselves for years and years and they don't you know get overly obsessed with training at least they get a window into understanding how much that can change their performance whether that's six months or a year or, or a little bit longer sometimes because that's useful knowledge you get to understand what does my body do if i put it through smart training and then you can walk away from that and go yeah i like what it did and I want to do more of that, or I'm going to do that intermittently during certain parts of the year, or it can be, it sucked. It's not right for me. Mentally, I just need to be at the crag 100% of the time, and I don't like it. And then at least you've tried it one phase of your life, and you can say, no, I'm going to go back to what I did before, which is perfectly fine, because you just it's just an exercise in understanding yourself and what your needs and wants are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I had the pleasure of um, spending a day with Chris Sharma as he was out here at the Red a couple of weeks ago. And I think he fits into that bucket there of he trained with Pacho Yusobiaga for like a, a couple of months, you know, I don't know, years ago. And when I talked mm. to him about it, he was like, yeah, that was it for me. Now I'm just getting out <laughs> on the route. But, you know, if you're climbing 515C multiple times a week, you're getting some training stimulus there as well. Mm. So 
yeah, to each their own. Appreciate you shedding some light on that for Victor there. Let's move on. Connor asks, can you comment on rehabilitating elbow tendonitis and if isometric holds from a pull-up bar can have any relevance? And if so, at which point in the recovery should I try them? I want to answer this, but I actually going to say that I don't think I'm the appropriate person to answer it, mainly because I'm just not an injury specialist. And I feel like this is one of those areas where as a coach, it's actually more sensible for me to say, you want to go and speak to a specialist and go and speak to a physiotherapist with this kind of stuff, because a lot of the time, and I've suffered all sorts of elbow injuries over the years, both tennis and golfers. And what I've seen with myself and also clients is that the approach in terms of rehabilitation and treatment of that it can be so different depending on the individual and the history and their own personal physiology so you've got to go and see someone generally in person and get a good assessment it's a really difficult thing to give generic advice other than from a preventative point of view is that a really good long-term habit of solid strength and conditioning around the shoulder girdle helps that particular issue and then also big spikes in load so the training load that you're doing up or down also seem to provoke pain in that area or inflammation or discomfort with that same issue, whether it's something that was pre-existing and you're just bringing back that that level of pain that you previously felt. So I think that's probably what I would need to say on that particular topic. So I hope I don't appear too flaky other than really, yeah, go and speak to a real specialist. That's not, not quite in my area of expertise. No, I appreciate that. A lot of respect for you to want to be mindful of not diagnosing or trying to treat injuries. Well, next time I have Tyler Nelson on or Natasha Barnes or, or somebody in that world, I'll direct the question their way. But we'll move on. Uh, we'll get one more here. And to those who uh, submitted questions, we'll kick them down to the next chat here with Tom after we've both sent our big projects this fall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> here we go. So Gug asks, do you recommend getting a tin deck and using that for training fingers instead of loading weight on a hangboard once you're about greater than 150% of body weight. So kind of two two questions. I mean, one qualifier w within that. But speaking of Tyler Nelson, somebody who's you talked a lot about kind of the benefit of a force gauge. And I think you all use them on your hangboard there over at Lattice that will test the force that you're putting on. They've become commercially pretty reasonable to get these days and can tell you exactly where you're at from day to day. What are your thoughts on using that for training and maybe even for warm up as well? Yeah, I think any of those digital devices, including the Tindec, are really good tools to have in your bag or, you know, in your toolbox for training and warm up. I really like them, really rate them. Uh, a whole number of us use them at Lattice. We have them here at the lockup and whether it's installed sort of internally within a fingerboard or it's a sort of additional bolt on for doing pickup work and just sort of pulling against a fixed point on the floor just they're, they're so nice because they're very quick in terms of instant feedback of the amount of force that you're generating they're highly portable and they're also a really good way of assessing how you're feeling on a day and they're accurate you know you like you can go out and start to warm up at the crag and see how much force you can generate and i often find that the amount that i can maximally for generate during my warm-up is a pretty good indicator of how close I'm going to be to my top maximal bouldering effort that day. For me, fingers are always a big limiting factor. So if my fingers are feeling weak and not very good on that day, not generating the force, I'm generally not going to climb very well on the high intensity stuff. So I'll either move my goals and go and try something which is lower intensity and higher you know, duration, pumpier stuff, or I'll come back a different day. But yeah, overall for both training and warm up, I think they're a really nice tool and they are applicable for beginners, intermediate and advanced climbers. There's no experience level there for me where I think, nah, it's not applicable to a particular group of climbers. That's great. 
Yeah, I really appreciate that. I think that, I mean, I've got one and, and I think that it's really interesting to be able to see from day to day how snappy I'm feeling, how strong I'm feeling. And this ties back into the root of this conversation, which was give us give ourselves the best chance to send on the day and understand those expectations. So if to your point, you're doing a warm up and it's just not there. The numbers aren't there. And it's, sometimes it's hard to just feel it. But if you see it in black and white, then maybe you change your your strategy for the day and you just work the top part of the route where it's past the limit boulder problem or whatever the case may be. So I appreciate that. And for anybody who's interested in the 10 deck or, or those types of tools, I, I have had a prior conversation with Tyler Nelson on finger strength as well as rate of force development, it's two separate conversations. And he brings those up in, in both of those. Tom, man, I really appreciate it always. You squeaked this one in before hopping on an airplane in just a few hours. I wish you luck, my man, out in the desert. It's going to be really exciting. When will you be back home? When can we connect again? I will be back the 1st of December. So I've got a decent block of time now in the desert. And yeah, I'm psyched. I'm so excited. I, I haven't been on good for climbing form like this for quite some time so i've got to be careful of expectations actually that i don't build expectations too high and i have to be yeah careful with that and likewise i really looking forward to seeing how you get on and it's been really nice kind of having these podcast interviews with you all the way through this journey of preparing for your route and going through all the different kind of sections of build up and what goes in as building blocks with the training plan and how it factors back into performance so it's gonna be yeah it's gonna be fun to see how you get on we'll, we'll have to we'll like be texting each other over this month with like how the burns have been going it'll be cool i totally will i'll let you know how it's going and yeah i've just been i've i'm so enjoying the journey and i know it'll make for a better podcast if i just totally crash and burn because it's called the struggle and so <laughs> I kind of win either way. Either I, I go up in flames and it makes for a great show to talk about, you know, how terrible the whole thing went. Or, you know, maybe I pull it off. And my coach over there, Roz over at Lattice, I just sent her a video of me getting up through the bowler problem. And, you know, she's taking a look at it and she's even like giving me little tips. Hey, can you flag out a little bit further on this? So I'm getting, not only am I getting great support from you all on on my training programs, but also just with you and Roz and everybody, just the psych is very high. and. Likewise, I'm so excited for you and Pete. Obviously, Pete's going to be arriving in peak form. He's been doing some hard climbing lately. And oh yeah, um, yeah, you're in peak form. You guys are going to be. You're going to have so much fun out there, man. I'm, I wish I could hop on a plane, but the Red River Gorge calls. I know, and it's a pretty good calling, to be fair. <laughs> and that there wraps up another fantastic deep dive with the one and only Tom Randall. If you are a patron, hi patron, you can see the full uncut video of today's convo with Tom right over on your Patreon feed, along with so much other bonus content from the best climbers in the game. We also have a group chat. Uh, we're doing some fun stuff over there. If you're not a patron, you can either subscribe right here in your Apple podcast app if you're an iPhone person, or if you listen elsewhere, pop on over to patreon.com slash the struggle climbing show to check things out. It's like the price of a beer each month. And you know what, after putting in long days in the editing room, like I'm doing every single week to crank out this content, I can definitely go for a beer. So thank you so much for your support if you can swing it. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning here, y'all, I'm going to share with you a trailer for the podcast series dropping next week called Written in Stone. It's being done by Chris Hampton, as you all know, of course, and an incredible team of creatives over at Plug Tone Audio. It takes masterful storytelling and it combines it with sound design, history, and superstar interviews into this climbing stew that you are going to devour the second each episode drops. It is so, so good. Check it out. As climbing moved into the third millennium, it was in a good place. Standards were sky high. Bolts and sport climbing had opened up previously unprotectable terrain, and the movement itself had become more dynamic and gymnastic. It was no longer all about the summit of the mountains and the big walls. From 10-foot tall boulders to 150-foot sport routes, climbers were seeking difficulty. And that's because of what came in the decade before. 
ethics had been challenged. The old school drew a line in the sand and the new, younger climbers had all but ignored it, opting instead for a different approach, a smarter approach. They wanted to climb hard things and the old way was holding them back. The French started it and taunted everyone else. Just do it, they cried. And they weren't staying inside their own borders. America, the UK, nowhere was safe from the hangdogging ethics and otherworldly footwork. But the Brits quickly got the message. Living on the dole, with difficult terrain everywhere, finger-punishing walls in their cellars, and punk rock erupting from their stereos, they were poised to do the unthinkable. They blasted off into France and launched into orbit before the French climbers even knew what hit them. And the French should have known better. Because at the start of the decade, one of the loudest, most boisterous climbers in the country had opened his mouth and made a statement that he would, I hope, come to regret. Why? Because Lynn Hill. That's why. Seriously, they should have known better. And so a new battle began, not one of ethics or tactics, but one of dominance, a pissing match of epic proportions that would see some of the best climbers in the world going at it. Antagonizing, yes, but also pushing each other to climb harder and harder, or maybe just to claim that they had. But outside the grade and root name arguments at the upper limits of sport climbing, there were others. Moving the sport forward in their own way. A philosophical German training fiend whose humility seemed to rise above had brought climbing to a new level. And then another, and then another, and he was poised to do it again quiet, thoughtful figure with the largest forearms ever seen doing the hardest moves ever done. A team of Wyoming cowboys riding out the worst storm imaginable on the side of a huge remote tower in Pakistan. A ghost in a French forest who would repeatedly raise world standards only to disappear into the trees. And another who would all but close the gender gap and is still criminally overlooked. We'll visit climbing areas that gave rise to legends. Bukes, Semai, Smith Rock, Branson, Fontainebleau, the Basque region of Spain, the Trango Towers, the Frankenjura, Raventor, and of course, Yosemite Valley. I'm Chris Hampton. You're listening to Written in Stone, climbing's most important ascents. This is season one, the 1990s. One, two. Over the next 20 plus weeks, every week, you'll hear the stories of 10 of the most important ascents of the 90s, followed by conversations with today's best climbers about how they were inspired by what went down way back then. First two episodes drop October 30th. Everywhere you get pods, subscribe now so you don't miss it. And please tell everyone you know at the gym, at the crag, follow the pod on your friends' phones, and together we can tell the stories of climbing's most important ascents, one decade at a time. All right, you heard the man. Go subscribe to Written in Stone right now. It is so, so good. And tell your friends while you're at it, your friends, your relationships, all of them. This is going to be a great series. And I guess while you're having that conversation with them, tell them about the struggle as well. And if you or they want a free sticker, you can rate and review the show over on Apple or Spotify. You can then hit me on Instagram or shoot me an email or something like that. Let me know that you did it and I'll mail you a sticker for your stick clip or your Nalgene or your forehead, or whatever you want to do with a Struggle Climbing Show sticker. It's up to you. It's out of my hands once I put it in the mail. 
All right, y'all, The Struggle's Carbon Neutral in partnership with the Honnold Foundation. This episode was produced and hosted by me, Ryan Devlin, and The Struggle is a proud member of the Plug Tone Audio Collective, a diverse group of the best, most impactful podcasts in the outdoor industry. I hope your fall season is off to a great start and that the big sends are just around the corner. But hey, if you're further off than that, like I think I am on my project, well, at least we know that the struggle makes us stronger. See y'all soon.